Plus, we are in the midst of one uh, huge, uh, probably the greatest uh, cultural revolution of humankind in the modern era, the, the, the cyber revolution. Yeah? And, and, and so even at the cognitive level, we do have difficulties and think about the difficulties to understand how algorithm work uh, in, in the years to come. Yeah? So all this ambiguity uh, found a response, which was the militarization of the internet. Yeah, uh, we started by saying we need to resist, we need to resilience, we need info sharing, we need business continuity. But at a certain point, uh, we now have a new mantra, which was launched by the U.S. in March 2019, uh, which we define the quest for cyber superiority. Yeah, the idea is that since uh, you cannot uh, really uh, allow our adversaries to uh, attain strategic objective uh, with, through actions under the threshold of the use of force, well, then you need to respond in kind. You need to confront persistently with your adversaries uh, on all networks uh, uh, to make sure that they understand what you think is uh, possible and what you think is uh, punishable. Yeah, so uh, we find ourselves in a situation in which uh, somehow, you know, the new uh, 2018 U.S. national security strategy says uh, strong sovereign states are our best hope for a peaceful world. Yeah, so we are back to Westphalia. We are back to the great power competition. We are back uh, 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 to a situation in which. Uh, uh, cyberspace has become the stage for a global confrontation, uh, which has a lot to do with great power competition, and that is determining uh, the decoupling of the ICT supply chain at the global level, which is determining the balkanization of the internet in different uh, uh, regional sub uh, uh, intranet. So, uh, uh, what, what is happening uh, uh, is that we are uh, witnessing a, a paradox which is mounting at the international level. Everyone is legitimately, uh, rationally uh, trying to build up cyber superiority, cyber power. Uh, but at the systemic level, this means that we are all less secure, that we have a huge security paradox which is mounting. And, and, and we are uh, entering this uh, paradox without international law, which we know is applicable to, international, to, to cyberspace. We don't know how. We are entering without many international treaties that helped us during the Cold War. We are entering uh, this new security uh, uh, environment um, uh, uh, without uh, experience, right? Without the uh, idea of how managing these things because they're new. Uh, and plus, uh, cyber uh, uh, has this characteristic, which is entanglement. Cyber connects like a, 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 a neural network, all the industrial, economic, cultural, informational, com, com, uh, uh, you name it, dimensions, yeah, at the local, regional, international, transnational level. So this entanglement makes the, the risk of a cross-domain escalation quite easy. Look, uh, the 2018 uh, uh, nuclear uh, posture review of the United States says uh, we retain the possibility of responding nuclear to a cyber attack. Because if a cyber attack strikes our command and control center, nuclear command and control center, our early warning uh, system devoted to nuclear stability, well then, we might respond with nuclear. So the risk of cross-domain escalation is becoming uh, uh, greater. And uh, what it is even more interesting is that we need to balance the strategic stability on the one hand, so the risk of mutual assured destruction, the Cold War and all that, with a quest for superiority. So equilibrium and superiority at the same time, which is very complicated, yeah? So to make a long story short, in sum, we are uh, at a point in which uh, uh, how can I say, uh, emerging disruptive technologies really will determine who will win uh, uh, in the battlefield, yeah? Uh, the, every state is legitimate, uh, 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 engaged in seeking uh, technological superiority. 
And this technological superiority quest is something that is really characterizing great power competition. The, the prize here, what is? Is the uh, Western uh, democratic liberal order. Yeah? Autocratic regime like Russia, China, they tell us uh, uh, who will become uh, uh, the ruler of the world is the one who will manage uh, master uh, uh, artificial intelligence, okay? So the quest here is uh, uh, for, um, for really our way of life, if you will, yes? Uh, we are confronted with cleavages which are very deep for the West, uh, 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 li civil liberties uh, and our, our way of life, uh, our freedom of speech, uh, uh, our hard-won conquest in, in centuries of battle for civilization, they now play out online. Uh, for autocratic regime, uh, the liberty, uh, the content uh, of, of internet is a potential uh, existential threat to stability. Yeah, uh, we do enjoy a great uh, degree of freedom, and we should never forget how lucky we are and how uh, this obliges us to defend uh, the, the, these hard uh, 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 fought conquests. So as I was saying, to make a long story short, uh, uh, ambiguity is on the rise, uh, entanglement is on the rise, the risk of surprise uh, is on the rise, uh, and, and cyber power has become an essential dimension of sovereignty in the 21st century. So to conclude, what is missing here? Uh, the point is, uh, we are giving a military response uh, to a political problem. Yeah? Um, uh, uh, our liberty and our security will depend enormously, will depend enormously from how secure and how free our internet will be. So uh, the point is, uh, we have uh, uh, cyber is a new policy and security area, and uh, we have a political issue without political thinking. We are totally unprepared. So my message to you this morning, and especially to the students that are listening to us, and uh, why is, is this relevant to us? Well, it is relevant to us because if we want a better world, uh, if uh, a different world is possible, um, well, then this has a lot to do with the battle for a stable and just order uh, in cyberspace. Yeah? Um, and, and, and we need uh, to make sure that there is awareness about what it is at stake. So thank you so much for the invite and this opportunity to touch upon these issues. Yeah. Oh, thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor for us. You touched some... Uh... Very interesting, but I would I would like to add concrete points, and uh, I would like to start with what Professor Zicardi said before: that is, small is dangerous. And I just, you know, while I was studying some cyber attacks, but like immense cyber attacks, like I don't know Stuxnet or uh, other ones, they may all start with a simple USB. So the the multi levels of uh, of vulnerabilities and issues between one can an individual cause on a state level for example to critical infrastructures is um, is something that we must take into account and i think that one uh, late motives between uh, your two interventions was uh, there's apparently a systematic lack of awareness regarding the cyber let's say domain so what do you, do you think that this lack is mm, more evident at the individual level or at a state level well lorenzo it's really a, <laughs> a nice question um, in my opinion at a local or human level we really see this, uh, uh, this um, lack of attention, in my opinion, uh, especially in the, um, just, to do some, just, just to give some examples, uh, uh, just think about the authentication issue. 
how we use uh, passwords or pins or codes to access to systems. Um, uh, the, the idea of username and password was born, uh, I think, uh, in the 70s or in the 60s of the last century. And today, also, in the dialogue we have with the devices to enter into a computer or a smartphone or an email account, we still use uh, uh, the uh, only one authentication factor. And uh, uh, simply, the idea of uh, a sort of uh, collective move to the second authentication factor, just for example, the bank, uh, uh, banks uh, and uh, insurance uh, uh, companies did about three years ago with some norms in the European Union. If you move, for example, to the use of a second authentication factor in the most common use services, and today all the services like uh, also personal services like LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, email can um, can give the possibility to use, for example, your smartphone, uh, something you own, uh, like your smartphone or uh, um, uh, a uh, one-time password generator. Uh, for example, uh, only this little move could, could uh, radically change the security of this first step. The second, just imagine, for example, the idea of a professional cloud um, and the idea uh, on the other side of a sort of domestic cloud, the common use of, for example, iCloud or Dropbox or OneDrive or Google Drive is very different uh, if you compare it to the use of uh, some cloud services that are based on encryption and uh, on uh, safe transmission of data. And the other point, in my opinion, of this lack of sensibility from a human and local level is the, the rise in the last five years of human vulnerabilities. And this is, I think it's very important. Human security had really a big problem in this last three or four years. And the pandemic really changed, changed again, changed again the, the framework. Um, there are a lot of attacks concerning uh, uh, vocal phishing, for example, or uh, um, the, the um, ha how to say, um, also if you are in a framework where hardware and software are really, really safe, uh, if there is a vulnerability concerning the behavior and the actions of the human, uh, of the human factor, uh, there is a, a very big problem. The, the GDPR, the European Union regulation about data protection, really focused, for example, of, um, on the minimization of the use of personal data, so that uh, it, it, it's seen as a mantra. But it's very strange, I don't know if you agree, to, to talk about minimization of personal data in the era of in artificial intelligence and big data. But uh, it's really important from a legal and from a cybersecurity point of view, if you treat data as little as possible, if you assess lit as, as little data as possible, if you do not ask more data to the people, then uh, it's really needed. You, you are contributing to, uh, to create uh, um, a really secure framework. But it's very, as you can imagine, it's very hard to talk to companies or to people, please treat data as little as possible, because today we are all in the era of big data. So the idea of collecting data is the idea of collecting the new gold or the new oil. And then, uh, and uh, to, to close this, uh, this personal point, and then I leave to the to, to Fabio for more an international approach. I really saw um, um, a lot of attacks concerning. I, I call them emotional cyber attacks, are strictly connected to uh, the status we are in today as a person during pandemic, because all the crimes that are connected to. Uh, to our emotion, uh, our uh, emotion, emotions are all of these crimes are really easy today to 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 attack us. Uh, just imagine, for example, mail, uh, mail, emails, or SMS or messages that are 
persuading us today to respond quickly to an email, to, to open a link, to uh, that prospect an imminent, in, an imminent danger to us, like, for example, the loss of money or the closure of our email account. Um, this is not new because phishing, as you probably know, started about 20 years ago. But in this uh, last year, uh, where all the people is, uh, is really has got fear, there is uncertainty for the future. We arrive at the end of the day that we, we are very tired. We, we are exposed about 14 hours a day to devices and the, the network connection. As you probably can imagine, these, these, new, these old cyber attacks had a very new, uh, I have a new skin today. And so when I talk to my students, we are really, uh, we are really, um, uh, it's, it's really important to make them uh, a little bit paranoid, you know, you know that in the hacker community, uh, paranoia is a virtue, is not a, a problem. So uh, that I really talk a lot with my students, do not respond to email that uh, are threatening you sanction or are announcing a reward, a prize, are asking something to be done quick. Because uh, in, in this uh, uh, specific historical moment, uh, we are really uh, vulnerable from this point of view. So it's very also important in my, in my opinion also to, to really think about uh, uh, this uh, Emo emotional cyber attacks. Uh, I was reading, I don't know, probably uh, Fabio is, uh, is really m more expert than me, but I'm, I was reading some uh, Europol or ENISA reports in the last month concerning especially new form of attacks that are uh, connected to our emotion, so, uh, especially frauds. Uh, there was a very high diffusion in the last two years of new frauds connecting COVID, connected, uh, connected to medical issues. So I think that the attention to the security of our emotions and this type of attacks is, um, is important. To close this, uh, this part, the multi-factor multi authentication and uh, of all our services to protect at least the first access to the services, in my opinion, is very important. We have to, to leave the idea of username and password and to use all the devices we have, uh, tokens, OTP generators, smartphones, app connect, apps connected to our phone and generating codes that could move us away from the old username and password. And we are, so we will protect the first very approach and, um, and assess to our devices. This is my opinion from a, a human centric point of view. Lorenzo, uh, my opinion is that you made the best uh, uh, possible uh, question. I, I thought about this issue of awareness for, for many, many years, honestly, because uh, it's really central. I have a lot to say <laughs> on the issue. I have seven -ish points. First, uh, we are in the midst of a cultural revolution. Uh, there is a problem of uh, evolution in our uh, cultural preparation to understand what's really going on and we i mean we are all in this together and no one is much better than than, than us i mean we, we we are all very much behind there is a there is a human element which professor zicardi was saying which is absolutely central um look for not pitya for instance that 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 um, attack that, that strike uh, europe a couple of years ago and blocked uh, hospitals in the uk that was an attack which was patched many months before. So it's really a question of cyber hygiene, yeah? And, and, and the, the, we are all insider threats, if you will, willing or unwilling, witting or unwitting, uh, but uh, we are all insider threats. Uh, the second point is that uh, there is, of course, a governance uh, challenge. Yeah, uh, and, and the, the issue of awareness uh, is very much connected to the issue of governance, uh, the, the gap that we have in front of us. Uh, governance gap is the name that we give uh, to the time that institutions need to cope with change. Yeah, uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, this time is very long. 
uh, institution in a very long time. Third, uh, there is a cognitive challenge in front of us. Really, how can you understand how an algorithm works? Yeah, you can't. Yeah, so uh, uh, really, there is uh, so much that we can understand about how about how cyber works. Yeah, uh, and, and this will be uh, uh, bigger and bigger. The, the best is yet to come. Uh, how will you understand uh, deep fakes uh, powered by artificial intelligence, uh, synthetic data, and all that? Uh, that's that's really a, 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 an intelligence, a, a cognitive issue. Uh, then, of course, uh, uh, you have a, a problem of even uh, there are things that you cannot foresee. Yeah? Uh, I, I'm very keen on this concept of emergent behavior, something that re results out of the interaction and the combination of things. And, and this combination cannot be expected. By the way, cyberspace is a man-made domain. So you, uh, philosophically speaking, you need to concede the idea that uh, black swan is always possible, something that you do not expect. Everything that men and women do is fundamentally potentially rotten, yeah? So it may go wrong. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, the point is um, uh, awareness, historically speaking, requires war, requires disaster, requires death, requires uh, events. Uh, 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 human nature is reactive more than proactive, yeah, unfortunately. But as I said at the beginning, I, I'm, I'm staggered by the fact that, uh, you know, we have uh, Russian uh, uh, nuclear missiles uh, uh, aimed at us, uh, uh, but we do never see, um, uh, you know, the streets uh, uh, talking about the threat of nuclear Armageddon. Uh, uh, there is a general lack of uh, interest regarding international issues that touch very, very close uh, our privacy, our life, our way of being. Uh, so it's a much general issue that uh, uh, the lack of awareness is inside that it's uh, the lack of awareness about what really defines our era. Uh, why are the students and, 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 and why are progressive people in the, in the left uh, in the world uh, not discussing ever the issue of stability in cyber, what we can do to just to provide and contribute to the quest for a just order in cyberspace, for our liberties, defending our liberties in cyber. Why is that not an issue of top priority discussion in the political agenda? I, 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 I honestly don't know. Um, so, and, and, and once again, really the, the best is yet to come. Complexity is increasing. Uh, we think about cyber warfare, but in fact, uh, future warfare will not be cyber warfare, will be algorithmic warfare, will be confrontation between system of algorithm that automate warfare, which will probably take a fraction of a second. And will probably be very difficult to understand how the decision-making process that algorithm follow to decide that yes, maybe a preemptive strike is correct. And yes, maybe we do have an incoming uh, uh, attack, uh, uh, cyber campaign, destructive or a missile uh, coming from space or whatever, hyperglide, uh, hypersonic. Uh, you know, hypersonic go uh, 30,000 kilometers per hour, yeah? It's a missile which probably we should think about, but uh, do you hear discussions about the implication of a personic glide on modern warfare? I don't think so. Yeah, unfortunately. And and uh, what about the risk of algorithm of of you know um, individualized warfare in the future? Yeah, uh, Professor Zicardi hinted to that. Uh, uh, the moment in which artificial intelligence uh, intelligence is able to profile us, the more we are on the internet, the more our uh, surface of attack expands. Uh, artificial intelligence will profile us and will, be, uh, and will allow cyber enabled information warfare, which is individualized. So we will come to the individualization of future warfare because uh, the weapon will be uh, calibrated exactly to act at the cognitive level to incite uh, um, uh, disruption, yeah? uh, social disruption, yeah? uh, the manipulation of content, the manipulation of, of, of information, yeah? the individualization of future warfare. So, uh, so yes, Lorenzo, the, the issue is how 
uh, where are we or what's going on and how come uh, this is not uh, become a top priority when we discuss uh, when we discuss our future but uh, that's a very general issue once again if I may, Lorenzo, another problem we are facing, me and also Fabio, is that the framework is really changing, is changing really very fast. So all the experience we had in the past, in many cases, is really a problem to apply to our to our, the actual framework. Um, me and Fabio started um, discussing these issues about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And this is a big problem because when we started to talk about cybersecurity 20 years ago, the main problems were, I remember, for example, at the end of the 90s, that were uh, terrorism, of course, after 9-11, uh, but also, for example, encryption. There was a very hard debate and political debate 20 years ago about the first encryption cases. Then there, there was the problem of tra tracking investig investigative data, so the digital forensic issue were arising 20 years ago, and then the global surveillance. But just after 10 years, uh, about 10 years ago, the focus in, in Europe was completely different, it was about the common internet use, the connection of big companies to the new European infrastructure. Just remember, Ken, that in Europe we started about 18 years ago to have a real digital market and digital connection of infrastructure. We started about discussing social media platforms and cybersecurity connected. In 2007, we had the arrival of the iPhone in Europe. That was really a big cybersecurity problem because it was the idea of the personalization of our connection. Our connection was with us for the first time. And then today, if, uh, if I have, or if Fabio, <laughs> if we have to to describe the map of cybersecurity and cyber crimes today in 2021, I think that it's a very different. We have, for the first time, we have crimes strictly related to data protection. Just imagine the idea of data breach, the idea of extortion, digital extortion, the idea of ransomware. We have crimes strictly connected to hate speech that it's a, really a new issue in, um, in Europe. We have crimes related to financial frauds, uh, uh, Bitcoin, non-cash frauds, that it's really very important. We have crimes related to children, that uh, also for Europol in Europe is really a big problem today. Just imagine in the last year, the growth of sexting and uh, auto-production of sexual material in domestic uh, context. We have problems today of crimes related to identity theft. The new value on the black market is the, the credentials of persons, the, the personal data. Ten years ago, if you remember, the main problem was uh, uh, home banking data and credit card data. But today in Europe, with the level of safety we have, uh, you cannot do so much with a credit card number, but you really can do a lot with the credential and the identity of a person. Then we have crimes, as I told you, strictly connected to IoT. And then we have all the world of non-cash electronic transaction, as I told you. So it's also very difficult for me and for, for Fabio to, to make a good use of what we learned in the last 20 years, because the framework is really changing. And I'm really happy that you and your colleague students so young are really starting to to focus on these topics because it was the, really the same approach we had 20 years ago when when all was new but we really also noticed that uh, the technology especially today is really changing our framework and our world around us in the in the world of security that uh, uh, there is really a need of a uh, very careful attention. The problem is that today, as Fabio told clearly, it, there is not only one approach. There, is, uh, there are legal informatics issues, the knowledge of uh, 
the knowledge of the technology. There are digital forensics and cooperation between authorities issues that it's really important. There are no more borders. There are geopolitical issues, and Fabio is a, is a master uh, concerning these topics. There are technological issues. But just imagine also the, how the U European Union is changing in these weeks uh, concerning the political approach to artificial intelligence, to digital market, to digital service. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's really um, cybersecurity for the first time is really collecting and connecting all the, um, all the human knowledge and all the human studies. And so uh, I, a suggestion that I, we could do to young people like you and very, very good students, uh, invest in this, uh, in this issue and study this issue because probably in the next five years, uh, there will be really new problems, new approaches needed. And we really love that young minds and young people with perspective also uh, divergent from ours uh, could enter in this uh, market. So I'm, I'm really happy to discuss with Fabian with you these topics because we are really on the edge of something that it's happening also here in Europe, it's not really common that some something concerning technology, sorry for the joke, is, is happening in Europe. Because we, we were always looking at US, at China, but in the last two or three months, the European Union really discussed the a radical change of our normative framework with several proposals. So we are really in the right place and in the right moment, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Thank As, you very much. Uh, Mao Zedong this. used to say, it, it's, uh, we are very lucky to live in these uh, changing times. <laughs> no, yes. But yes uh, if I may, uh, uh, I totally agree with Professor Zicardi. Uh, uh, we uh, see that uh, we are, uh, um, I see that I, we are, I am enjoying the conference, yes. Um, I, I see that, um, um, you know, uh, governments are investing everywhere to develop cyber capabilities uh, and, and, you know, to develop uh, the capability, well, cyber power as an essential component of sovereignty, as I said. Uh, the point is, we also need to invest at the institutional level. We also need to bring into play uh, the tools and, and skills uh, of diplomacy, of government, uh, of uh, um, uh, doctrine, of strategy, because we need, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, uh, cyber is a new po policy and security area, but uh, it is a very important, very a great impact on our, our daily life. Uh, but there is not enough political thinking. And uh, 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 honestly, I mean, I, I start my lessons when I, I, speak, I teach uh, cyber diplomacy with the picture of the white rabbit. Uh, cyber is somehow a, a an Alice in Wonderland uh, kind, of, kind of world because it forces us to rethink many of the assumptions upon which we, we managed international security for many decades, yeah? And, um, we, we, it, it is a paradigmatic shift. It is a game changer. I mean, um, as I said, ambiguity is, is on, on the rise, but uh, in, in military terms, ambiguity means, for instance, that emerging disruptive technologies are blurring the line between net, nuclear and conventional. Uh, how do you define hypersonic uh, technology? Because it's, it's, it's conventional, well, it's dual capable, but it's conventional, but it's uh, of strategic impact. Or how do you define, uh, I don't know, the, 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 the connection between uh, um, uh, all, all, all the uh, uh, surprise that uh, the development and the, 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 the operationalizes, operationalization of, of uh, algorithm will bring into play. Uh, this is, a, as I said, cognitively difficult to anticipate how the world will be and uh, and and we certainly need political thinking we need uh, to make sure that students uh, that in the universities that uh, 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 we develop a political vision about the, the, the uh, about the how important it is for our future 
to, to work for a better just order in cyberspace. Yeah? And, and once again, I'm very surprised that there is no left, uh, no progressist around the world that is yet able to propose a vision on how we would like uh, our uh, uh, liberties uh, and security to be protected, to be promoted uh, at the global level. It is certainly one of the most important challenge of our time. Thank you very much. It was extremely insightful. I will have like 1,000 questions for uh, both of you. But sadly, we are reaching to the end. We have uh, more or less 20 minutes tops. So I, I and I want to leave uh, some space for uh, Q&A from the participants. I think we have, we have a lot of questions. And uh... sorry, my internet connection was a bit unstable. So the two most voted are is there a trade-off between cybersecurity and freedom of individual persons? Please, Professor Ziccardi, I think that suits you. Yes, I started uh, writing about uh, 25 years ago about the, the very important relationship between uh, the right of the individual and uh, liberties and uh, cybersecurity and cyber crimes. Um, it's really very difficult to, to deal with this topic because on one side, the cyber crime in our experience and uh, cyber attacks are one of the fastest growing forms of crime we know. So uh, cyber crime, cyber criminals and cyber crimes networks are really becoming increasingly sophisticated. And uh, on the one side, the state and the governance must have uh, in at any moment the right operational tool uh, to to reach some capabilities uh, to take them and you can imagine uh, and you can imagine lorenzo to get the right operational tools from a government and state point of view concerning these crimes the connection with the attack also to liberties and uh, rights of the citizens is very is very is, is very common so there is a constant fight about uh, the use of technologies for the best type of surveillance and investigation and the protection of the data and of the liberties of the citizens. As you probably know, cyber crimes are really difficult to handle because are, how to say, high profit and low risk uh, uh, activities. So uh, there is a problem of uh, anonymity, but as you probably know, anonymity is also a right uh, for the person to, uh, to, to not show their credentials or identity. Um, you probably know that cyber crimes has, have, have no borders. So there is also the problem if the law enforcement could act some, uh, uh, some norms that uh, um, go, how to say, over the idea of border and the limits that is typical of the law. And it is very important also for the right of the people. Um, in, um, in the last years, we had, we had a lot of conflicts between the idea of uh, protection of uh, civil rights, human rights, uh, the, the possibility for the person to live quietly in the digital society and uh, and digital uh, and uh, how to say uh, enforcement. I don't know if if Fabio agrees about this. This, in my opinion, in my in my opinion, the wars around encryption and the wars around anonymity and the wars and the wars are the polit wars. I mean, political and uh, legal and uh, cultural wars about the use of encryption the use of Tor and similar anonymity uh, software, and the war against uh, hate speech uh, and the freedom, the limit of freedom of expression in the actual international framework, uh, I think that, uh, are, in my opinion, are the three main important, uh, 
I don't know, Fabio, if you want to add, for example, also the, the war against the, the non-cash as uh, the, the, the Bitcoin and the idea, the wrong idea in many cases that uh, Bitcoin and uh, all the world of the crypto values are strictly connected to criminal activities. But I, I see, to, to answer to, to the question, in my opinion, the conflict between uh, personal rights, uh, human rights, uh, and uh, cyber and governance and law enforcement is in these three or four uh, topics today. Professor yeah. Ruge, you might, uh, I, you might uh, wrap it up uh, with the other two questions. So we're talking about uh, efficiency of democracy, international common response. I think it's something that you might connect it with, in, I mean, freedom of individual person. I think it's pretty obvious. Right. So, uh, I mean, in the morning, uh, my uh, intellectual flexibility is always uh, at the very, 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 very bottom. So I don't know if I can connect the three questions so different, but let me give you my perspective on, on the issue of freedom and freedom and, and security, uh, which is, of course, a very, very fundamental issue. Uh, first, we are a little schizophrenic. We uh, don't care about providing our data uh, to Facebook, Twitter, international companies that uh, store our data. We don't know how, we don't know where, we don't know about, with what legislation, we don't know who, to, who they sell it to, we don't know what they do with it. Uh, but then, uh, the moment in which your uh, elected government uh, asks uh, to uh, abiding the law uh, help uh, uh, intruding the network to understand what's really going on, well, then we freak out. Now, this is absolutely uh, schizophrenic. This is nonsense. Uh, we need to trust our government more than we need to trust uh, international foreign companies uh, uh, that manage our digital life. Second, uh, Yes, we are confronted with a dystopic future. If you look at how the internet is used for social control, uh, for, uh, for social schemes, uh, for uh, manipulation of, of the population around the world, the world, yes, then we do have a, a huge uh, issue and a huge risk. And we all need to be sus, sus extraordinarily uh, aware uh, that there is the risk, of, uh, there is the risk of a race to the bottom. There is a risk of uh, um, uh, a model of censorship, a model of uh, dystopic uh, use of the internet uh, promoted around the world, which is competing with our most fundamental liberties, and we need to be very much aware of the risk associated with this uh, uh, quest. Third, and finally. Uh, uh, there is this idea that uh, you are free uh, without the government, yes? Um, uh, if you think uh, privacy and security are, are opposed, well, then you are postulating that you are more free without the government. Now, somehow I may also agree with this uh, perspective in a idealistic Kantian uh, perspective of uh, the liberation of humankind from the fake uh, artificial divisions, uh, uh, this fake celebration of diversity that allows uh, 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 autocratic regimes uh, to, imp uh, to implement this topic future and uh, 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 deprive from fundamental liberties, uh, depicting a world in which we do not want to see our children. Um, uh, but then again, uh, I also think that uh, uh, the state uh, elected governments, uh, Italian government for which I've been working for the last 20 years, uh, uh, they are protector of our freedom. They are fundamentally concerned uh, with uh, uh, the protection of our uh, uh, law, of our way of being, of our liberties. Uh, and so we must trust the government, uh, I believe, uh, to um, uh, be a, pro a protector of liberty. Yeah? So I don't know whether this security freedom uh, issue is, uh, uh, sometimes we say there is no freedom, there is no freedom without security. Yeah? Security is instrumental for the uh, cherishing of any other value. And we shall always remember that. Yes, if I can add, um, if I can add, um, uh, I think yes, also connected briefly, to, please. 
also connected to a question about algorithm and the years to come, because Fabio told a very important word that is trust. The whole strategy of the European Union also concerning to algorithm to answer to Nicola, to, to Nicole questions. Uh, for the European Union, trust uh, must be at the foundation of also the algorithm and artificial intelligence strategy and politi political strategy. The idea is uh, of an algorithm that is uh, human centric, that is uh, sustainable, that is uh, secure, that is uh, inclusive, but uh, that is uh, trustworthy. So this is very pro important, in my opinion, the, the word trust that Fabio that Fabio explained. It's all, also strictly connected to the European Union policy uh, connected to algorithm and artificial intelligence. Okay, really it was wow, a lot of to a lot to process. It was really amazing. Unfortunately, we are we are reaching to an end. So thank you, thank you very much. It was uh extremely insightful and uh, since well, well we're talking about awareness i hope all the participants uh, levels of awareness uh, increased dramatically <laughs> during this conference thank you to all the participants for your questions and uh, to being so numerous and active and i would like to remind you that after this conference there will be the meet the speakers 